you have your Bible this morning, I encourage you to cha- uh, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We'll be looking at verses 12 through verse 30. Uh, again, that's 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through verse 30. Aren't, aren't we thankful for the blood of Jesus? I mean, think about it. Without the blood of Jesus, we would be without hope. That we would be eternally condemned, uh, eternally separated from a God who created us in his image that we might worship love and serve him and without the blood of Jesus we would have no hope would have no future and so today we have a hope and we have a future because of what Jesus did for us on the cross as we look at first uh, Corinthians chapter 12 I, I want to begin by just uh, reminding you I'm sure many of you have heard the quote before but it's uh, reportedly at the signing of the Declaration of Independence that it was reported that Benjamin Franklin made a statement that became uh, pretty famous he said we must all hang together, or assuredly we shall all hang separately. Again, he said, we must all hang together, or assuredly we shall all hang separately. And the point that is made here is that those who are willing to step out and to sign the Declaration of Independence, that once they signed that document, they could never go back. If they began to fragment, if they began to back up, that when they were found, they'd be found guilty of treason. But if they stood together... Benjamin Franklin believed that their unity would forge a nation that would be free. And we see today the results of that freedom and the great cost by which uh, these men sacrificed for us. I know that our church is going through a difficult time right now. But if we choose to stand together at the cross and continue to move forward with our mission to make disciples, then I believe that God will continue to do a mighty work here in this place. I I do want to correct something I said this morning uh, I'll really clarify something I said this morning in the teacher's meeting. I said that, you know, we can't really s- sit around and feel sorry for ourselves. We have a mission that we must accomplish. And I still believe that to be true. But at the same time, at this moment, uh, most of us are grieving. And we don't, there's a lot of unknown, and we're afraid of the unknown. And it's okay to grieve, right? When Jesus found out that Lazarus had died, what did he do? He wept. He wept. Even knowing that he was going to raise him from the dead, he still wept over the heartache that he knew that Lazarus' family had gone through. And so even as we pray and we look for what God has for us in the future, uh, it's okay to grieve. It's okay to work through that process. But let it, let it be known here today that it's not okay for us to sit down and to not continue to work and to move forward into the future. And we think about the future that God has for us as individuals and even for us as a church that God has provided everything that we need that we might know him and that we might make him known. Everything that we need to know him and to make him known, he has provided for us through his spirit. In the Apostle Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth, he's dealing with a church that's divided into all kinds of of factions. And if you go back and begin to read through uh, both 1st and 2nd Corinthians, you see a church that is, is divided over leadership. There were some who who championed the Apostle Paul, some Apollo, some uh, were really uh, braggadocious and said, you know, y'all can say that you're Paul's disciples and you can say you're Paul's disciples, but we're Jesus' disciples. Uh, when you read it, you know, it's a really the right religious thing to say, but when you really look at it and you read that text, it almost comes across as sort of a, just a false arrogance to say, you know, we're better than the rest of you. And so they were divided over leadership. They were divided over spiritual gifts that some would say, well, I speak in the tongues, and some would say, yeah, but I have the gift of prophecy. And they go through all these different things, and there was this, this envy among spiritual gifts. And there's a lot of other things that they begin to battle and divide themselves into various factions. And a lot of uh, first, uh, Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth really was, was driving home this point of, of the reality that we are not to be about factions, but that we are to be in this together, that we are part of one family, that we're part of one body, and we're busy doing the task that God has called us to do. In the first um, 11 verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the Apostle Paul has stressed that the Holy Spirit gives us spiritual gifts so that we might exalt our Savior and so that we might accomplish our God-given purpose of building up his church so that we might advance the kingdom of God. And then in verses 12 through verse 31, which is where we're going to be at here this morning, Paul uses this analogy or this metaphor of the human body to describe what the church should look like and the unity that should exist among us. And I want us, instead of reading the whole uh, verses 12 through 31 this morning, I want us to sort of break it down 
in pieces and break it down in bite-sized uh, chunks. And I want to just point out some truths as we sort of walk through the text. Again, we'll begin in verse 12 of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul, again, writing to the church in Corinth, says, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews are Greeks, slaves are free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but many. Let's pray together. Father, I just want to ask this morning, Lord, as we, as we delve into your word today, I pray that we would not look at it as some ancient book that might have some truth that we might can glean. But I pray, Father, that as we study your word together today, I pray that we might understand and recognize that this is your revelation, not just to the church of Corinth, but it is your revelation to us even in this day that you want to speak into the depths of our hearts, that you want to change us and to transform us into the image of your Son. And so, Father, today we just pray that you might give us open ears and open hearts, that we might hear what you want to say to us. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. As we look at these first few verses of this uh, section that we're going to be looking at here this morning, the first thing that I want you to see is that the body is one, but it has many members. The human body is a unit, and it cannot be separated into several bodies. If you were to come up here and you were to chop off uh, my left, hand, my left hand would not all of a sudden become a, another body. And actually what you would see happen is, one, I would be crying really bad. I probably, honestly, I, I'm really allergic to pain. And so I would probably pass out immediately. Uh, but what would happen is that part that has been separated, and if y'all didn't stop the bleeding, both parts would die. But the part that's been separated from the body would definitely die. And so even though there are many parts of the body, the body is one in its unit. And so if we think about the church, which is, we're told, the body of Christ, although it is made up of many parts, if it is going to be healthy, it must have unity of heart and unity of purpose. If the church is going to be healthy, then we must understand that our primary responsibility is to know Christ. And then from that, out of an overflow of what God is doing in our lives, it is our responsibility to share with others about what God has not only done for us, but what God has done for them as well, that we are to know him and we are to make him known. And it only comes as we begin to understand that we are one. We're not many, we are one. The many become one. And then in verse 13, Paul makes two points to drive home the reality that the many have become one. He says in verse 13 again, he says, for in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews are Greeks, slaves are free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. We, we think about what Paul says here in verse 13, that we were baptized in to one body. You understand that water baptism is really just an outward sign. I think, I think Pastor Jeff mentioned this last week during baptism, that, that water baptism really is a, an outward sign of what God is doing in our lives. Right? That it's, it's similar to what a wedding ring. If I, if I were to take this wedding ring off, does that mean I'm no longer married? I'm still married. But this wedding ring is an outward symbol that I am married, that I belong to someone else, that we are together as one. And so water baptism, when Paul talks about here, he says that we were all baptized into one body. It, both these, actually, both these phrases, being baptized into one body and also being made to drink of one spirit, are both pictures of salvation. And so we think about baptism, what baptism means. That I was dead in my trespasses and my sin. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. And so as, as you come down into the baptism waters, it is an outward visible sign that I was once dead in my sins. And that I am buried in the waters just like Jesus was buried in the grave. And yet I have been raised to walk in newness of life. Right? Right? That baptism is, an, is a visible sign of what Jesus has spiritually done in my life. That I once was dead, but I have now been made alive. Listen, we are all saved the same way. There's not multiple ways to be saved. There's only one way to be saved, and that is through Jesus Christ. It's only through faith in Him that we can be saved. And so if all of us are saved the same way, it means that in the same way that we are saved as one, we become one. Right? And if you really want to look at the ultimate extreme, uh, the, the ultimate picture of this text, 
It also means it for our Methodist brothers and sisters in Christ here in town. And the other Baptists and the others who believe that Jesus is the only way, we technically are all part of one body. That we're not, at comp- we're not in competition with one another, we're not at war with one another, but that we are together as one body. As long as we have a common confession that Jesus Christ alone is Lord, then we are a part of the same team. But we see that identified in the local church here at Southside Baptist Church, that, that we are one church, that we have been baptized in the same way, that we've been baptized through the Spirit of God into the body of Christ. But he goes on and says that we were all made to drink of one spirit. Listen, there's not multiple feelings of the Holy Spirit. There's one feeling of the Holy Spirit. It happens at the moment of salvation. God's Spirit comes and dwells in us. The Bible says that we become the temple of the Holy Spirit, that we become that, that temple, that earthly temple that the Holy Spirit indwells and empowers to carry on the task of God. And so if we have received the same Spirit, if we have drunk of the same Spirit, then we belong together, that we are one in Christ. And so what you see is that Paul used this, this visual illustration, or actually these two illustrations of, of our point of salvation to say that we who once were separate, now we have been made apart, that it's no longer about our ethnic groups or our financial status, that we've all been brought together as one through the power of the Holy Spirit working in our lives. And then in verse 14 he says, For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. Listen, we are one, but there is to be diversity in our unity. To me, this is one of the real strengths of the church, and that is that we are all different. We come from different backgrounds. Some of us were born in the promised land. Some of you were born on the mission field here in Texas. That was a sort of a joke. It's bad when you have to explain that it was a joke. Of course, I should know better than mess with Texans, right? You put on the sign, don't mess with Texas. Um, we come from different backgrounds. Some of us grew up in the country. Some of us grew up in the city. Some of us grew up in the hood and then moved out in the country. Uh, actually, I was, actually, I was born in, in the early years was in the country. Then I went in the hood and then I went back to the country. Um, so we got all of it. So we come from different backgrounds. We have different life experiences that all of us have experienced different things in our lives. We have different passions there's things that that when certain things are talked about some of us are bored to tears and some of us are on the edge of our seat because there are different things that we are passionate about we have different spiritual gifts and we have different personalities listen our strength is not found in uniformity but it's found in diversity working in unity together to carry on the purposes of God listen I am thankful that you are not like me and I'm thankful that I'm not like you probably a lot more on your side than my side. I wish I was like some of y'all, but um, I wish I could pronounce words like terror instead of making it sound like terror. I was corrected this week to say that it's terror, terror, not terror. But, um, you know, we're all different. And, and aren't you, th- and it, can you imagine how boring life would be if we were all just alike? I mean, I'm the guy you don't want to go. I mean, you don't want me playing your vacation. I try to make it fun excitement, and it's always boring. I had a good friend of mine in Shreveport that, man, he could plan the best vacations in the world. I mean, he could, I mean, the whole time you knew you were going to have a good time. Matter of fact, if I, were go, if I was going on a vacation to a certain place I knew he had been, I'd call him to find out what I needed to go see and where, particularly where I needed to go eat because he loved to eat, so he could always point out the right place to eat. But it's, it's not in uniformity. We don't want to all force us all to be alike. But it's in our diversity we need to come together in unity to carry on the purposes of God. The second thing I want you to see in the text this morning is that every part is essential. In the church of Corinth, there were some who felt that others were unimportant. That they felt like, well, you know, my spiritual gift and my personality is what what the world really needs. And the rest of you, well, actually, let me back up. I'm getting my points confused. In this part, there were some who said, I have no purpose. I don't know why I'm here. I don't, know, I don't know where I belong in the church. That's what happens when you leave your notes. You get all jumbled up in your head. Or I do. But some felt that they were unimportant to the body. Let's move ahead in what Paul says in verse 15 and verse 16. He says that the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body. That would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body that would not make it any less a part 
of the body. Can you imagine how absurd it would be if your foot were to say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong. Or if your ear were to say, well, because I'm not an eye, I'm just not going to participate. I, you know, I'm not going to do it. It's somebody else's fault. I should, have been a, I should have been a hand or I should have been an eye. They're a lot more prestigious. I do not like being a foot. I have to wear that nasty shoe and I smell real bad. If you like my ears, you got nerve damage, you can't hear half the time. So um, anyway, and so what a, what a sad thing that so often in the life of the church, as I think over my last 30 years of ministry, I cannot tell you how many times that I've heard someone say something like this. I don't have any gifts, and I'm just not important to the church. I don't have any gifts, and I'm just not important to the life of the church. Listen, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you have a gift. Every believer has been given at least one spiritual gift. And you need to find that gift. You need to use it. Oftentimes, you can identify that spiritual gift by your passions. Sometimes, it'll be someone else speaking into your life and to say, you're really great. Sometimes, it's by trial and error. I'll never forget uh, having a church member that said, you know, hey, I want to try to teach this uh, preschool class. And after the second week, she came to me and said, I don't need to teach that preschool class. Those guys have no control. It's total chaos. And so we made an adjustment. Sometimes it's by trial and error. Sometimes it's by trying things and then seeing that that's not what it is. And we keep trying different things until we, fry, we find the right thing. The problem is that we're so afraid of failure. We're so afraid that we're going to mess up, that we're going to disappoint somebody or let somebody down, that we're unwilling to step out and allow God to use us. Or, or we tend to say, well, I'm not very good at public speaking or I don't have a singing voice, I make a joyful noise, and that's about it. And so we begin to think that because we can't do something in a stand-up-in-front-of-everybody position, then we can't be used by God. I was sharing with somebody this week that my natural giftedness is not standing up in front of people talking. Matter of fact, if I was doing anything else but preaching, I would probably be crying even though I'm not a crier. I would be shaking. I would be, it'd, be, it'd be just embarrassing. Um, I'll never forget speech class in college. I was such a nervous wreck in every speech that, I, I mean, things I had done all my life. I grew up doing mechanic work, and so the demonstration speech, I was going to show how to pack a wheel bearing. Uh, and Wayne said, so you know, I had the wheel bearing, I had the grease, and I'm going to explain it. I broke out in sweat. I couldn't talk. I couldn't communicate. My dad's a mechanic, and so the first thing he did when I was 10 years old is he taught me how to pack a wheel bearing. The second thing he taught me how to do was clean the bathrooms. So what I learned is everything my dad didn't like to do, he taught me how to do. The third thing he taught me how to do was to count inventory on his parts. Um, and so it's, it's, to me it's not a public thing, but um, when I stand up to preach, I feel more comfortable and more confident in what I'm doing because I think it's something that's not of me, it's of God working in my life. And so sometimes it's by trial and error and so, it's error. And sometimes the things that you feel like you cannot do, those may be the things that God really wants to do a work in your life. Let's move on. In verse 17, it says, If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? If each of us had the same gifts and abilities, as I mentioned earlier, not only would we be ineffective as a church in carrying out the Great Commission, but wouldn't we be a boring place? Can you imagine being a church where everybody was just alike? One, we'd be fighting all the time, right? Well, either that or we'd be submissive all the time. We'd say, well, you know, I don't know what to do. Either that or we'd be saying, I know the right way. And then this person would say, I know the right way. And we'd be all fighting one another because we all know the right way. We all know what it ought to be. And so I'm thankful that we're different. And God designed it that way, that, that we would come together in all of our different passions and uniqueness that we become something special. And we become the body of Christ. We become that body that, that God put here to carry on his kingdom purposes in verses 18 through verse 20 it says this but as it is arranged God or arranged the members in the body each one of them as he chose if all were a single member where would the body be as it is there are many parts yet one body it's in God's sovereignty that he places us in his body where he wants us to be and he equips us to do exactly what he wants each of us to do the problem is that we feel like that because I can't do what somebody else does that I'm not important in the body. But in reality, all of us are equally 
important. In verse 19, 20, Paul reminds us again that, that if we were all the same, then we would not be the church of the living God. We would not be the body of Christ. Instead, we would simply be just a freak show. We'd be some oddity. Can you imagine somebody that was just a big eye? That they just sort of looked, I mean, they couldn't really pick anything up. They couldn't walk. They just was a big eye looking around. How awkward that would be. But the reality is the church is one, but it's made up of different parts. The third thing I want you to see this morning is that no part is more important than another. In the church of Corinth, there were also some who believed that some of the others in the church were unnecessary or were of less value. And so what you had is you had some that would stand up and say, well, you know, because I can preach and you can't, then you're really not needed. And there were some who really, there was this air of superiority that they thought they were better than everybody else. And so Paul has a word for them as well. In verse 21, he says, The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. And so the Apostle Paul moves from people who are struggling with an inferiority complex to those who have a superiority complex or a God syndrome. They believe that they are God and they are not. A physical body that rejects parts of its own body is diseased. In the same way, a church that treats others as unimportant, that church is also diseased and sick and unhealthy. And so every one of us has great value. One, we've been chosen by God to know that God loves you, loves you as a person. He loves you individually. It speaks to how important you really are, that every one of us carries great value, that we are very important. In verse 22 through the first part of verse 24, Paul says, On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. And so the parts of the church body that are behind the scenes working are as vital as the ones that are in the open, preaching, teaching, and singing. So often we take for granted those who serve behind the scenes, those who prepare our meals. Uh, the two Beckys that came this morning and pre prepared breakfast for our church uh, Sunday school leadership. What, what happens if they don't show up? Everybody comes and they think, so I had to get up this early and come and listen to him, and there was no reward. And so it's important. We, we think about those who clean up after the meals. On Wednesday night, we come, we eat, we go to choir practice, we go work with children, we go to Bible study, we go all our different ways. And we don't think about those who are in the kitchen that are washing the dishes, that are putting things back in their plates. What happens if they're not here? What if they don't clean? Then what happens is the next time that we show up for a meal, all those dirty dishes are still stacked up and everything is a mess. We think about Vacation Bible School. We often focus on those who are teaching the classes and dealing with the children or leading worship. But what about those who are going and buying the groceries that are preparing the meals each night for the children? That's a vital place, a vital position. What about those on Sunday morning that stand at the doors and greet people? That Some of them that aren't even official greeters, but or they, they just do it because they have a heart to say hello to people. And they stand up there and they pass out candy like BR, uh, hug people. They say, good morning, how are you doing? We're so glad that you're here. What kind of a church would we be if we didn't have people like that? You know, so often, you, know, you don't really notice them really unless they're not there. If they're not there, then you begin to panic. What about those who invite others to church? Those who never meet a stranger and everywhere they go, they're always inviting people. I had a member at Calvary that was in her late 80s, and I think she witnessed about every doctor at every hospital uh, here in uh, Lufkin and would invite them to church. And I was amazed at how many of them were believers and actually lived in Houston or other places and would drive here and worked in the week and were actively involved in other churches. But she was constantly talking to them about her Savior and inviting them to her church. That's a person that unless you're in the room with her, you never know because she's not going to brag about it. She's not going to come to church and say, Pastor, this week I witnessed a X number of people. She's never going to say it to anybody. She's not going to brag about it. The only way you know is you happen to be sitting there as a pastor one day when the doctor comes in and she starts witnessing to the doctor in front of you and you begin to see what's going on. What about those who pray for the church? What about for the shut-ins that we have, the few that, that are at home even this morning that are praying for our church that none of us know that they get the prayer list each week and they look through them and they pray for the people in our church. They pray for those who are sick, those who are having struggles. Those are the people that we never know about. And so often we take them for granted. Listen, every one of you have an important part in the life of this church. 
And it may not be out in the forefront where everybody looks at you and brags and says, boy, you did a great job. But listen, if you're doing what God has called you to do, then the most important thing is that one day when you stand before the Father, you will hear him say, well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in the little things. Now come and reign over the big things. And that's really what's important. It's not so important to have your pastor say, good job, even though I should do that, and Jeff should do that, and all the other leadership should do that. But ultimately, the main thing is to hear God say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Without the little things being done, the church would not function. Moving on in verse, the last part of verse 24 through verse 26. It says, God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it. If there may be no division in the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Here Paul gives us a couple of reasons why we must uh, never show favoritism and why we must always understand and we must appreciate the, the fact that all of us are different and all of us carry great wealth. First of all, he says that it's vital if we're going to avoid strife and divisions in the church. If we start taking others for granted or we begin to think that somebody is, is less important than us, what happens you begin to have division and strife in the church. When we begin, each of us, to understand the importance of one another, then what you see is you see unity in the church and you see a common love and care for one another, which is the second part that Paul says. As we begin to really understand how important every member of this church is to this church, it's at that moment that we begin to care for that person to a point that when they weep, we weep. When they rejoice, we rejoice. The sad thing in the church of America today is that so often we see the opposite. When somebody is rejoicing, we are jealous on the inside because our life isn't as good as theirs. And when they are broken and when they are struggling, too often we rejoice because our life is better than theirs. The sad thing is that we even see it in, among churches. I've been surprised this week at how many people that I, I never hear from that would text me or call me. Most, they wouldn't call me. They would text me. Sorry things are going bad at your church. And you could just sense that it really wasn't about they really cared about this church. They were sort of glad that we were struggling. And my response was, man, we're doing good. God's in control. We're hurting. We're doing good. We're unified around one purpose. We love one another, and we're going to make it through it. And so it's not about, it should never be about trumpeting over somebody else. But instead, we ought to rejoice with those who rejoice because we may be next. And we ought to mourn with those who mourn because we may be next. And so it's about seeing the importance of one another. It's only then that we begin to invest in each other's lives to a point that we see that God is really a good God that loves all of us and he wants us to care for one another. In verse 26, we're reminded that the key to unity is mutual concern for one another. Um, whatever comes our way, good or bad, we must decide that we're going to stick together. Just like in marriage. All marriages go through hard times. There's, there's not a marriage that doesn't go through hard times. But it's about a commitment to say, we're going to stick this thing out, and we're going to work through it. The easy thing is, is to run our different ways. Listen, we're a family. Come what may, we're going to stick it out, and we're going to stick together. And we're going to stay focused upon the purpose that God has for us, and we're going to love each other, we're going to care for each other, we're going to mourn with each other, we're going to rejoice with each other. Whatever may come, we're in it together. The fourth thing in the church, there is diversity in gifts and ministries. In verse 27 and 28, Paul says, Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating in various kinds of tongues. In verse 27, Paul reminds the Corinthian believers that together they make up the body of Christ and individually they make up the various parts of that body. In other words, the, the many become one, that we are a part of one another, that if you chop any of us off from the other, we're going to die, we're going to perish. But if we stick together as one body, then we will accomplish the task that God has for us. In verse 27, a couple of things real quick, that, that God is responsible for the diversity in the church, that, that God chooses who he places there. God chooses what spiritual gift you have. It's as the Holy Spirit gives to us. And that God places each of us as he wants to place us. And it's not about being jealous of other people's giftedness. It's not about 
of wondering where we fit, but instead we just need to jump in and figure out where we fit, that God placed us here, so what does he want me to be doing? The second thing is that, that Paul begins to give a list to, to illustrate the variety of ways in which God calls and equips his people to the work of the kingdom. And this is not an all-inclusive list of giftedness because we see several other places where there's different gifts that are listed, but it's just an idea of what God does in the life of the church. He says that he gives apostles. And, and the, the basic meaning of the word is one who is sent out on a mission, one who has been sent with a message. The reality is in some way all of us have been called to be apostles, right? That all of us have been called to go with a mission. But here it's talking in the New Testament day, it's talking specifically uh, about those who have been called out as missionaries to go to the places where the gospel's never been heard. If you go back into the time that the New Testament was written, it, it uh, spoke specifically to the original 12 disciples, excluding Judas, but Matthias who took his place. And then I think as Pastor Jeff mentioned a couple of weeks ago, the Apostle Paul would fit in that as well as those original apostles. But God still calls out apostles who are to go and to take the gospel into the areas where the gospel has never been preached. But he also talks about prophets. And these were anointed by God to expound upon the revelation of God's word within the local church. That God gifts men in particular to speak as prophets. I think he does women as well to speak in specific areas to to speak truth into the life of the church, to take the word of God and to speak it strongly and say, thus saith the Lord. He also calls us teachers, those who are gifted for the ministry of studying and interpreting the word of God so that the church can grasp and understand. And we see that even as we looked at, I don't know how long ago it's been, when we looked at Nehemiah chapter 8, that you had the Levites that went around explaining what God's word said so the people could understand and apply it to their own lives. That you have those who were miracle workers. It was an act of God that is contrary to the ordinary working of laws of nature, and it was given to the church for the, the uh, given authenticity to the apostolic, apostolic message of the word of God. That was easy to say, wasn't it? Maybe for you, but not so much for me. Um, I believe in the, in the beginning that the miracles were given so that as the gospel, as the, as the word of God went out, that they began to do words, I mean, they began to do signs and miracles so that those in those areas would see that they really did come from God. We oftentimes still see a lot of this in the missionary world today, don't we? You read some of these stories about what God does in some of the unknown places where there is no written word or the people don't understand it. You still see signs and wonders. You see these great miracles that are being done all over the world. Matter of fact, there's some places in the world today where we have some missionaries there that are sort of under cloak because if it was discovered they were missionaries, they'd be killed. That, that there's not a, a great missionary force and there's very few believers or there are no believers where people are having visions during the night while they're sleeping of Jesus Christ coming to them and saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And they get up and they say, I'm going to follow you, Jesus. And all of a sudden you see this great movement among, among a lost people group because God is showing and doing miracles. But we see these miracle workers in the life of the church. You see the, the gifts of healings that they were given to the church, again, for given authenticity of the word of God that had the gifts of healing. You had, uh, had those who had the gifts of helping. It speaks of helping and supporting others in the day-to-day -day ways. I think if you look at the life of church, there's probably more people who have the spiritual gift of helping than maybe any other spiritual gift. They have that ability just to, to serve. They, they, don't, they, don't, they don't need the limelight. Matter of fact, there's some of them, if you mention them in public, they're going to be fighting mad. Right, Don? You've got some workers in the children's area that if you call them out, they're going to be mad. They want to just stay behind the scenes, sort of like Don, and do their thing. Don't give them a whole lot of fanfare. And they want to they help. They want to work. You have the gift of administrating. It's the gift of leadership. The word carries the idea, the original word, it carries the idea of a pilot who pilots a ship and keeps it on course to its proper destination. In the church, God calls out those who have the gift of leadership to help guide the church to the port that he has it, to guide that on the course, to keep it from getting off base or going the wrong way, but to keep it going the way it's supposed to go. And then it says in various kinds of tongues. And this is the ability to speak in a language the speaker does not know. But the main point that Paul is trying to make in listing these various gifts is to emphasize again the various ministries that God has given to his church. That there are all kinds of ministries, there's all kinds of gifts that God has given. In the first church that I pastored, I was telling somebody about this week, I had a lady that was in my church that um, I used to joke with her, but honestly I really believe it. I believe she had the spiritual gift of letter writing. She could write a letter to someone, and in just a few words, 
could speak such truth into your life that, that God used her letters to minister to people. She's probably been dead now 20 years. And I promise you, we could go to Mangum, Louisiana, and we could knock on some doors of some, pop- some people who attend New Light Baptist Church that were there when she was there and say, hey, do you have any letters from Lula Cheek? And they would open their Bible up and they'd pull out a letter that she wrote to them 20 plus years ago. And when they're discouraged, they pull that letter out and read it because God used her through her letter writing. Um, I write emails and letters, and I'm like, God, I feel so embarrassed to even send this out. I mean, I do good to put like three words together and make a sentence out of it. And it makes sense, and yet she had the ability to do that. And so God has a purpose for you. And you need to find that purpose, find that passion, and jump into it. Moving on, in verse 29 and verse 30, it says, it says, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all possess gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret? And so Paul asks these series of rhetorical questions to remind them that God never intended for every believer to have the same gift or to fulfill the same purpose, that we are all different on purpose so the church can be all that God would have it to be. In verse 31, he says, but earnestly desire the higher gifts. He says, and I will show you a still more excellent way. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, what does the Apostle Paul talk about? He talks about love, right? And he goes through a list. Matter of fact, unless the Lord changes, that's what we'll be talking about next week, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And so here, Paul is sort of transitioning, I, I believe, and he talks about these higher gifts, these most important gifts. And we know that love is not in and of itself a gift. Really, love is a fruit of the Spirit working in our lives. But he says that we need to desire a more excellent way, or he says, I will show you a still more excellent way. What is that more excellent way? The more excellent way is love. Paul says that, that anything that's done without love is useless, that it carries no purpose, that it's, it doesn't accomplish what God intended it to do, that love is the driving force behind everything. And you look at that some of the things that Paul illustrates in 1 Corinthians about love, that, that it's love that edifies or that builds up the church. Without love, the church cannot be built up. If you have the gift of prophecy and you're always hammering on sin, but you don't do it in love, you're just beating people up all the time. And if all you do is go and ooze on people, oh, it's so good, it's so good, and you really never give truth and truth mixed with love, then you end up with a dysfunctional church that sits around oozing all the time. Right? And so it's through love that we edify, we build up the church. It's also through love that we seek the common good. It's because we love one another that we seek what is best for one another, that we look out for one another, that if we see a brother or sister in Christ that's drifting off, it's because of love that we, we rebuke them or we instruct them, we help them get back on the right path. If we see our brother and sister in Christ stumble and fall, it's love that motivates and drives us to pick that brother or sister in Christ up, to not walk by and stomp them and say, you deserve that. Instead, we are to seek the common good. But also, it is out of love that we desire the things of the Spirit. We, we want to be led by the Spirit, right? We, we don't want to be led by the flesh. We want to be led by the Spirit. And that is exemplified. That is, it comes out of a life of love. It's as we love God and we love one another that we begin to see that in us, God begins to place in us a desire for the things of the Spirit. And we want to be more like Christ. We want His Spirit to have more control over us. 